So I'm a huge fan of the Ronin 4D and have long espoused the ridiculous potential for the camera DJI has built. That's how it's done. That's how it's done. So when I heard British cinematographer Rob Hardy used it to film Alex Garland's 2024 movie Civil War, I had to get the whole story. Get him! Yeah, move it! You gotta move! Wow. They really shot this film with the Ronin 4D. Yo, yo, Josh, yo, we are on our way to London to meet up with the DP of Civil War. I could have just Skyped this, but I figured we're just gonna go to London to do this interview and get the best bangers and mash possible ever. Welcome to London. For those that don't know, Rob Hardy is a bit of a legend and has shot some of the most thought-provoking and visually arresting films of the last decade. He's long been a collaborator with Alex Garland and is a DP that is known to embrace the latest camera tech to push narratives forward. What we wanted was as much authenticity as possible. It's palpable. You feel it in the air. Honey, it's time to call this. Uh. Now, it wouldn't be a Make Art Now episode if I didn't team up with longtime critic of the Ronin 4D, Mr. Phil Bloom himself. Special thanks to Cinegear Pro for lending us the space, and of course, my Shidoshi Philip Bloom for his, um, masterful help. All right, made it on time. Philip, let's do this, baby. He never disappoints. There he is, the man, the myth, the legend. I have so many questions with the practicality of using an $8,000 idiosyncratic chicken head camera to film a legit $50 million Hollywood blockbuster. Yeah. Rob, it's a pleasure meeting you, man. Pleasure meeting you, man. Thank you for joining us today. You have worked with Alex Garland before on... Everything. On everything. That's your guy. Yeah, yeah, our working relationship started with his ex machina, Annihilation, Men, Civil War. What's it like working with him? Alex is one of those directors who's kind of like a no bullshit kind of person, which I love. We're here to do the best work we possibly can. So we build the world, we inhabit the world. Can you start a little bit further back and on action, just walk through that yet, way? We create these 360 degree environments, right? We got Humvees coming in from the left. We've got tanks coming in from the right. We've got choppers coming in. It's like all real hardware. We've got ex-military people. We've got guns firing. And then you throw the actors into that situation who are our journalists. Mm -hmm. It's palpable. You feel it in the air, you know? And so what? how do you capture that? You capture that by being with them. At any given moment, you're going to be looking over there or you're going to be looking, and it's like you need to enable the director, you need to enable the actors, the space to work, but you've also got to make sure that whenever you're looking in a specific direction, it's going to look great. I'm sure the actors probably appreciated that too. Yeah, they did. And particularly with something like Civil War, I mean, there was no question that what we wanted was as much authenticity as possible. So is this why they chose the Ronin 4D? So they can shoot these super immersive scenes with multiple operators simultaneously in this epic 360 degree world that they built. I got good news. Now, to be fair, they did not exclusively use the Ronin 4D on this shoot. While it was used for most of the ground-based run-and-gun stuff, the Sony Venice was actually the primary A camera on sticks, on car mounts, and on cranes. Then, a handful of smaller cameras were used for specific purposes, like the Sony A7S III for the side mount car shots. And they even used a red camera, but not for the reason you'd think. We used a red for specific things. Okay. Which was like uh, a lot of Kirsten Dunster's photography, like her still imagery. Oh, is that because you needed like super high resolution? Or no, we, needed, we wanted to shoot high speed, doing like 300 frames. To capture these moments, like, you know, the moment when a, a photographer picks up a camera and there's that moment you lean in, you see the picture, and you, you pick the camera and you lean in and you take the picture. Now, is that because you guys wanted to select the right frame where it tells the story the most, or was that just because of motion? Okay, got it, that makes sense. In other words, it wasn't just Red's high frame rate, but they needed a global shutter so that screen grabs from video would mimic a real photographic image. Now, what was the thought process when you and Alex were shopping, like, how are we gonna do this? We're both very much about composition. 
and we were discussing like how are we going to approach this what's the best way we can a have full control but b create this really immersive thing our references were like well obviously war photography but also newsreel footage from war zones that sense of unpredictability that you get when you watch that stuff you're always on edge when you're watching it and we wanted that sensation that at any given moment anything could happen we looked at Steadicam, we looked at Stabileye, all these things that we've used before, but we wanted something else that was going to give us a handheld, was going to give us Steadicam, was also going to give me the ability to control the frame remotely. Master wheels are... Exactly. For those who have not played with the Master Wheels, it's a super expensive, super pro way to control many of DJI gimbals, such as the Ronin 2, Inspire 3, and of course, the Ronin 4D. With weighted grips and encoder, it's a more precise and cinematic way to tell the gimbal head where to look and how fast to turn. It's super pro shit. You want to adjust the frame a little? I was just like, is there a steady cam where I can be basically in control of So that was the decision. It wasn't it yeah. wasn't the Z-axis necessarily. It was being able to remotely control the, the camera head. Effectively. And you had how many cameras did you uh, multiple cameras? We used the Venice, we used the red, we used the A7S for the car stuff, and then we used these. Anything that was on the ground mm -hmm. and that was immersive, it was all these. So were you going back and forth between like locked yep. shaky cam stuff yep. and then instant like, yep. yeah, you can only do that on this camera. You can only do it on this camera. And I loved that. Specifically for Civil War, it made total sense. And it, it suddenly freed us up to do that much more. We didn't have to stop and go, okay, bring me the handheld camera. All right, bring me the steady camera. It's like, it was all in one. And then even better, I could also sit back on the master wheels and I could be on the comms to another operator who's holding the camera and running into this <laughs> war zone. And I'm back on the wheels and it's like, okay, switch to sport mode. Now switch to back to the Z axis. It would be like handing the baton. Sport mode refers to the ability for the operator to hit a button on the inside of the right hand grip and lock the gimbal so it turns from four axis fully stabilized into a locked handheld mode. It's insanely efficient for this type of run and gun shooting. Were you guys using multiple cameras at the same time? for some of these scenes? Yeah, we would. We, I mean, at any given time, we use from two cameras, one camera, two cameras, up to six. If you're only able to control one camera at a time, are you just having really in-depth conversations with the other camera operators? That's what I'm saying when it comes to that 360 environment. You, you can throw in three, four cameras and they'll never see each other and they'll get amazing frames. So from a technical standpoint, it makes a lot of sense now. Rob's choice for using Ronin 4D are choices that likely save them a ton of rigging time and ultimate flexibility. Oh, and let's not forget the ridiculous 20,000 foot range of the wireless transmission system. And did you guys have any issues with like the wireless transmission stopping on signals? As far as I know, we, we didn't, there was, there was nothing like that. There were no issues in the sense that we had, I mean, look, we, we broke one of the cameras. I think. Mean, How'd you do that? Is there a BTS footage of that? I, no. <laughs> But one of them went down, let's just say that. The comment section when I did the review on the wireless transmission was like, oh, you can't focus pull with the latency of like 60 milliseconds or whatever, you need it quicker. You guys didn't have any issues with that. Not as far as I know. If there were issues, my it's first AC's off. kept quiet about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I it's... didn't notice any. Yeah. Put it that way. Most of the Ronin 4D scenes were shot with the Leica M08s. These are modern upgrades to the original Leica still lenses, but with newer coatings and of course, 0.8 focusing gear. These are such exceptional character rich optics that are so compact that not only are they sought after for the Ronin 4D, but they could be used for the Inspire 3 as well. If only someone was crazy enough to make an adapter and counterweight system. Though I guess that's for another story. Let's talk about the, I think it's the best scene in the movie. Let's talk about the gravel pit. <laughs> First of all, how many days was the whole shoot? Uh, the whole shoot was like 50, 50 plus. Okay. 50, 51, 52, something like that. And then how, and 
walk me through that, that sequence. That se yeah. It was three days, as I seem to remember. It's it's like the heart of the storm, you know? The writing there is so strong as well. I mean, it's like amazing. Those two things colliding, like Jesse, yeah. with those words, it's just like... Dude, he, he just, he's amazing. Yeah. I've been a huge fan of his work for a long time. Okay. What kind of American are you? We watched the blocking and we figured it out. And then Alex turns to me and he's just like, he's like, everything we've discussed doesn't feel right. This, this needs a different kind of treatment to everything else that we've done. Mm -hmm. So we decided we were going to sit way back mm -hmm. and we were going to observe and we were going to be very long and everything was going to be very still. We wanted to feel the tension. And we wanted to make it palpable and we didn't want to dress it up and we didn't want to go yeah we didn't want to say we're going to create tension in the way the camera is moving or any of that stuff and we've been doing a lot of that obviously with these up until that point and yeah. after but this was like it needs to speak for itself so we need to do as little as possible because it's all there and if we choose stylistically to sit back on longer lenses and keep the cameras quite still you do bring the audience in when you, you when yeah, you, if the whole movie is moving uh, and then in one scene it's like now we're locked i'm guessing it was shot on the sony venice it was it however when kaylee goes into the pit i was in there with her with one of these we shot the piece where she climbs out and so I was down there in, in there with her and synergy between camera and actor where it's just oh my god oh my god oh my god and we need to leave so so that's that's where we use one of these China just stop it okay when we get into the war of it all it's the horror of it how do you get that across and you get that across by just being in it it was almost like reverse engineering it from that point. You take that image and you, you basically track back into the world that it was taken. And I start to think about what happened in the few seconds before that image was taken, what happened in the few seconds, or minutes even after that image was taken, and also what's going on around the edges of that frame, the, the things that you can't see, and what are the decisions made by the photographer within those milliseconds that the photographer is taking that image mm -hmm. to go, that's the frame. Coming back to that commercial district sequence where there's a firefight, dudes get inside the building mm -hmm. and they start going up the staircase and we're in front of them and we're behind them. Now, normally to do, to achieve that shot, mm -hmm. I would have used steady cam mm -hmm. or some kind of like like a stabilizer remote head system what we wanted was the smoothness and the aesthetic of a steady cam because of the spiraling stairs we would have got like we would have done it in stages so stage one reconfigure stage two but with this we managed to do the whole thing in one so i could have then my operator one of my operators all he needed to concentrate on was like just holding the thing and i'm on the wheels on the master wheels framing it as we're turning these corners and and making sure we are locked in i remember at the end of that both alex and i looked at each other like how worse could we have done that there was no it's way amazing. we could have done that with any other piece of technology at that time you know Does a cinematographer typically cover like the color of it, the final picture in terms yeah. of color? You didn't go with a typical blockbuster, t heavy teal and orange. No, we didn't. Right. It's very, it looked, it's very realistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What it needed to look was, needed to feel kind of muscular, it needed to feel confident, mm -hmm. and it needed to feel arresting, and it needed to feel like the imagery that you would expect from from war photography. Yeah. I'm a same. huge fan of like photographers like William Eggleston, Saul Leiter, but specifically Eggleston was, was a good reference for this because the color science behind his photography or, or that period of photography he did during the 60s and 70s has that sort of quite arresting feel to it. It's, it's, it's real, it's reality, but at the same time, there's something slightly heightened about it without being kind of garish. And with, and with this, often like Alex will be like in the grave which I love, he's just like, we find a look we like, and then we just push and push and push until it breaks. We need to find the breaking points before we, we can then hone it back. It's like we find our sweet spot. So we go, we love this look, now let's push, let's see where the edges of that 
is, let's push it and push it and break shit. And then you'll see it and we will play it back and it's like, oh my God, that looks like shit. But then you bring it back into that sweet spot because you know you found the right thing. I love that process. Driving through the fire scene yeah. in the car, yeah. that broke a little bit of that aesthetic and it kind of, there's like a couple of times, and I mentioned this earlier, where it's like you're going this heightened reality yeah. and then it goes into like this dreamlike you know, the dream, the dream was stuff. that inspired by the Paradise California fires? You would have to ask Alex where that initial seed came from. I and mean, we knew that there was going to be a forest fire. As far as I was, uh, you know, okay. they go through a forest fire for whatever reason. It, it looked like it was shot both practically and with some heavy uh, spark. I'm assuming this, the embers were visual effects. All practical. What? Yeah, all practical. What? So basically they wet down the whole area. We had this uh -huh. mile long stretch road, forest either side, and we wet down that entire stretch. We had these metal trees with fire coming out of them, and then they were augmented in VFX really beautifully. And then we had a truck with those creating embers, mm -hmm. so it was like fire. It was mm -hmm. a truck with a fire on the back of it, they're throwing wood into it, and they, they, they're kind of, it was like an ember machine. And so we, we would have our picture car we would be behind it on our pursuit vehicle, filming the car, and then in front of the picture car, you've got the ember vehicle, and it's throwing up all of this shower of embers. So then we would just shoot and shoot up and down this road all night, like here, 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 and then just doing ember specials and just like filming embers, because we just love all that stuff. Wow. Yeah, and then, and then later it's layered in. But all that stuff you see of it hitting the tarmac, everything, it's all real. I hardly knew Sammy compared to you, but yeah, you knew him. Do you recall what camera setup was used for that beautiful lake scene where, it, yeah, the girls are talking. It looked They're like a long the, lens. It looked like it yeah, was that Yeah, that was uh, 75 H series. That was, oh, off okay. a, that was off a crane. That was off a 30 foot Techno crane. On the Venice? On the Venice. We reshot the this, this scene unintentionally because we just kept going. On this crane, I'm shooting Kirsten walking up to the boathouse and Kaylee's already there and we find it and then we just kind of move in on it and they start the scene and then it's like well this is just this is too much of an opportunity to miss so then we swing a lens and we go closer and we shoot the whole scene there's a a, a very specific effect where the shot of kirsten dunce on a couple of the scenes there's like achromatic aberrations or color fringing in the corners That's right yeah, yeah. towards the end it's replicated again and then at the very end it's a shot, it's, yeah. Where was that decision made? Was that made, was that one of those ending, like in post shots? It, w it was a little bit in post. We, okay. need, we needed, in the edit, basically, that decision was made. So, so we knew that those images were gonna serve, narratively serve that purpose. It's very clever, because it's so subtle. Yeah. And only a photographer would pay attention to that. Wait. This was all shot on the 6K version. I wonder what his thoughts are on the newer 8K version. Am I correct in assuming that there's a leap in color science from six to eight? There is. With the 8K, now you can just, I feel like you can pull, you can push and pull the image much more. You can, and there's a, there's a great, what I would call a night mode or a low light mode. That is a vast improvement, I think, from, from what it was originally. You're shooting something next. Um, yeah, yeah, we're shooting something next. And you're using the 8K version? Or the 6K? We'll be using the 8K version. This is just to say that we'll be using this in conjunction with, again, Venice cameras, which yeah. is like my sort of main package. For this next thing, it's like, it's taking the experience I had using them on Civil War and saying, actually, there's a new way to shoot action in a very immersive style. Since Civil War, I've just been thinking, always thinking about like all the other applications you can use for a tool like this. There are so many ways you can do it. I think really what it is now about is improvements or updates that could happen, which I'm sure will, mm -hmm. but also the lens tech. Moving forward, I like the idea that these cameras are always going to be a smaller part of my main camera package, basically, moving forward. Rob, 
thank you so much. Pleasure, man. This has been such a pleasure. But what if I had another camera that I might suggest for your next film? Because I could use one of these. <laughs> <laughs> Completely. This 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 feels. You can like... I can control it remotely from like 20 feet away. Yep. Done. <laughs> <laughs> it's refreshing to see a pro like Rob use this camera in ways that most of us don't have the opportunity to. What I take away from all of this is he's the type of artist that selects the right tool for the job, regardless of norms or branding. He's the artist that's not afraid to lean into the ever-evolving world of new camera tech, learn it and push it to its breaking points. Now, whether you love this film or hated this film, the consensus all seems to be the same. The cinematography is f***ing fantastic. And what I love most about this film is it follows those who brazenly throw themselves into conflict for the sole purpose of distilling it down to a single storytelling frame. It's a love letter to all of us photographers and cinematographers out there. A $50 million Hollywood film shot in 53 days on a chicken head running gun setup. Thank you very much. That is a wrap. That is a wrap. As for me, I'll keep aspiring to be Rob and keep breaking cameras. Um, is there anything you want to talk about? Is there anything that I'm not asking? Am I f***ing this up? No, you're not f***ing up. Okay. You're doing a great job. I'm doing okay. All right. Yeah, you're doing a great this job. This is my first one. Ha, ha, ha.